six, five, four, three. Hello and welcome to the U.S. Sailing Starboard Portal. Today we're excited to have Jim Teeters with us. Jim is the Technical Director of the Offshore Racing Association and in general is a VPP guru. Jim is a naval architect who worked for Sparkman and Stevens in Langen Design, but more importantly has been directly involved in the development of VPP rules for more than three decades. We'll be taking questions during the presentation, so please be sure to put them in the comments box. And now Jim, off to you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Nathan. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to say welcome to all our clients and everyone interested. We hope you are safe and well, and at worst, doing what I'm doing, struggling with cabin fever. Or perhaps some of you are learning what your kids do with teachers every day and the challenges they face. Um, everything is fine with us at ORA. We are developing products and services to make your sailing an even better experience. And of course, it's always an opportunity to do more research. Today, let's review a season of Owara regattas. I'm using this kind of like a travelogue format, and we'll use those events um, to illustrate the kinds of services and activities that OR is involved in. Uh, so for fun, we're gonna start mid-season with, uh, I could guess I could call it the crown jewel of West Coast sailing one of a number of crown jewels for sure. But this one is the California 500 with three Mod 70s, Maserati, Power Play, and Argo, racing from San Francisco Bay to San Diego. They are racing under our multi-hole rule, which we call ORRMH. So I'm gonna bring up the panorama of downtown San Francisco, the starting area, inside of the Golden Gate Bridge. There's Maserati. If you uh, take a close look at her rudder, this is one of the few Mod 70s that's capable of fully foiling. So her centerline uh, centerboard has horizontal foils as do the rudders. We launched this multi-hole roll a couple of years ago. It's been used by any number of races, Newport Bermuda, quite a few of the California events, including this one, as well as the Transpac race. So let me rip this back off again. <clears throat> That's part of the California, five, that is the California 500. It's part of California Offshore Race Week. And uh, let's move on. <clears throat> this is a VPP rule as is ORR. So I think it's worth spending a few minutes just very briefly describing what a VPP rule is. So fundamentally we measure everything about a boat that impacts speed, boat shape, rig sail, stability, propulsion, we use those measurements to calculate the physical characteristics of a boat. So it's the hydrodynamics of hull, keel, rudder boards, anything that goes into the water and the aerodynamics of anything that's in the air. So it's not just the sails, but it's also the rig and the hull. We use high school physics to balance forces and moments. Uh, those of you who took high school physics should find this all very familiar. Uh, the drag of the boat is going to be equal and opposite to the drive on it. Uh, there's the lift of what's in the water. It's going to be equal and opposite to the side force coming from the aerodynamics. The healing moment equals the riding moment. When all of the moments and forces are balanced, the boat is not accelerating. And those who remember Newton means that it's going at a constant speed. We call it an equilibrium condition. It's nothing more than high school physics. Um, and we also use calculus, which is now a high school course, to find the combinations of boat speed, heel angle, and sail settings that will give the uh, fastest speed in any specified wind and sailing angle to the wind. We use calculus basically to, to do a search. So if you were trying to find the top of a hill and you were blindfolded, what would you do? You would take a step in one direction and 
see if you're going up or going down. You would turn maybe 90 degrees, take a step and see if that's up or down. Use those two bits of sampling information and figure out your next step on where you're gonna go to go uphill rather than downhill. The VPP does the same thing. It does sampling in different directions of sail controls, a reef and flat. Uh, it might vary the boat speed and the heel angle until it finds the balance of forces and moments. Okay, while well, the essence of the VPP rule is predicting the boat speed at any combination of wind speed and wind angle. So one I'm showing here is what we call a polar chart. <clears throat> For those that you who have not seen this before, which is probably very few of us, think of this as an overhead view looking down on the water. Where my mouse is moving now, you can see a series of boats pointing in different directions. Those directions are relative to the true wind which is represented by this arrow. So the wind basically is flowing from the top to the bottom of the screen and our chart. This is an angle here where this boat is and this line extended out of 30 degrees, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, continuing all the way down to 180 degrees. Each of these curves represents all the points at which you could sail at and the boat speed. So the further away you are from the origin, the faster you're going. So let's take this point right here. It's along this curve, which is the five knot curve. By the way, this is a boat called Angry Cupcake, a Ranger 33. So you can see its fastest speeds are on the neighborhood of eight, eight and a half knots. It's a small boat. <clears throat> but if you're sailing upwind, you could pinch it here. When you get to where this little X is, this is marking where your best upwind solution is. It's the angle of sailing and the boat speed, which gives the best performance upwind. We can work our way all around down to here, and here's your optimum downwind. If you were to sail still deeper, uh, you'd be going slower and slower, and you might be interested in what this kink is. This is where we transition into going wing and wing. So at very deep angles, depending on the size of the Genoa and the size of the spinnaker, it can be faster to sail wing and wing. However, in six knots, you really would want to sail with your spinnaker at this angle. So there's a curve for six, eight, 10, and we calculate on up to 24 knots. And if we take a look at this curve, it's interesting. Ultimately, your best downwind VMG for this boat is to go wing and wing. Again, that's a function of the size of the Genoa and the size of the spinnaker. This is also a relatively heavy boat, so it likes to sail at deep angles uh, in the heavy winds. We can go to a lighter boat. This is a Transpac 52. <clears throat> Similar curves, except the wildly different performance down here. The boat is much lighter for its length, so the boat will start planing, and you can see 6, 8, 10, here's a 12 knot curve. By the way, these curves are at standard 10 meter heights, which is what we use for handicap purposes. But we often print out what the wind speed would be at your masthead unit. So for this boat, the masthead unit is quite a bit higher than 10 meters off the water. So instead of six, we're seeing 6.6 .6 because they will see more wind at the top of their mast than there is at 10 meters. In other words, the mast is well above 10 meters. But going back to the curves, you can see around this area here, the boat is really starting to take off between this wind speed and this wind speed. And just look at how much further this little circle is out away from the origin. So this is the 14 knot curve, whereas this one is the 10 knot curve. So two knots more wind, the boat wants to go to a much hotter angle. So I think the real illustration I'm trying to get with these things is that a, a VPP rule, which does these calculations at every wind angle and wind speed, can pick up these really critical difference, differences between boats and embed that in our handicaps. Now, to do a handicap out of this, uh, let's say you want to do a windward leeward race um, and you're going to center it around 10 knots. So you would take this solution here and this solution here. If it's equal legs up and downwind, you would average them. That would give you your average speed or seconds per mile 
and you would use that for a handicap for a windward leeward race. And you would do the same thing for this boat and you'd have a relative difference between the two boats. And that is how we do handicaps from a polar diagram. I'm going to show you some handicaps that are much more complex than that. Uh, but even then, even if it's a complex definition, we distill it down to something simple because that's what we find sailors want to use. Well, let's take a look at an ORR certificate. I'm breaking it up into images that you can see on your screen. Here's the top of a certificate, just some generic data describing the boat, a uh, few characteristics of it, like the capsize screen. We like to put a speed prediction here so that it forms a handy reference. You can see it very quickly. This boat has a canting keel uh, that happens to be Roy Disney's boat. It's a Volvo 70 modified called Piwacket 70. If we go further down the certificate, here is the measurement trim data, including measurements that Nathan and his measurers might have taken in the field like freeboards, the specific gravity of the water, Here's sailing trim, which includes uh, some gear um, as well as the crew. The boat's heavier, different, uh, it's a deeper draft. And in these three boxes, we have uh, rig and sail dimensions. So they're all there in numbers. I mean, we store our boats metrically, and I think Nathan appreciates that because of his work on the UMS UCS. Metric is the universal measurement language. However, uh, we're well aware that U.S. sailors like their feet and their pounds. So that certificate will show the same dimensions in that system of units. Uh, going further down the certificate, this is a table of boat speeds. It's our standard wind speeds from 6 to 24 uh, and wind angles from optimum beat down to optimum run. So this row here is degrees of heading. The bottom row is degrees of heading for your optimums and in between it's boat speed and knots. This is also available as a performance package from the Offshore Racing Association. Uh, you can get to that through our website, offshoreracingrule.org. You can also contact Nathan and his team at the Offshore Office of US Sailing because we link up our pours uh, with our certificate processing. Theoretically, you don't have to have a certificate in order to get a performance package, but that's typically, typically the procedure. Okay, further down, uh, all of those speeds and knots are converted to seconds per mile. Uh, a lot of people like to think in terms of that, handicaps often are time on distance seconds per mile, and you can compare yours versus your friends, and you know per mile how many seconds he owes you or vice versa. At the bottom of the certificate is the ratings, and these are choices that are made out of those polar tables. So for example, here's some standard ratings, a closed course basically is sailing in a circle. Six to 24 knots, we have some time on distance handicaps. These are seconds per mile. But as I said a minute ago, we found that most people uh, like to work with single number handicaps. They don't want race organizers to pick a wind speed before the race. So we distill this down into a time correction factor which is used for time on time racing. So this particular boat is a very fast boat relative to our FAR 40, which is our uh, scratch boat for TCFs. They're about 52% faster on this particular course. Windward leeward 50-50, 60-40 is three legs up and two legs down. Uh, we published the Newport Bermuda race here because they use performance curve scoring so there's a seconds per mile prediction at each one of these. I'm not going to discuss performance curve scoring today. I think that would take a good 15 minutes. And I think there are other things that we can discuss. Here are some general ratings. Uh, GPH, closed course, here's that 1.526, which is repeated. Non-spinnaker, offshore off wind. This is used by the Marblehead uh, Halifax race. Um, but I'd like to give particular attention to the custom ratings. One of the features that we use with ORR is to work very closely with race organizers and give them the handicaps that they want for their events. The bulk of our events are offshore. So uh, weather forecasting and knowing what the typical conditions are 
become important. So here's three Chicago Macs. I'll discuss their ratings a little bit later on. Bayview Mac rating, Marion Bermuda, right on down. Now Acapulco has a number that they use. That's an area where we have regular round the buoy racing and San Francisco Bay. Okay, well, let's talk about that performance package, which I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, the two URLs, actually this is a URL, offshoreracingrule.org. There's a tab there that will link you to ordering a performance package. And as I said, you can use this email address. This will go to all of Nathan's team at US Sailing and for all the services they supply, including performance packages, that's your contact information. What I'm showing here is basically a text description. It's a table, it's a six knots. We've got um, all the information that goes into the performance package. There's a true wind angle, true wind speed, true wind angle, parent wind angle, apparent wind speed, the other way around. Uh, boat speed, VMG, the heel angle, reef and flat are indications of what you're doing to depower the boat. A value of one means you're not doing anything. Reefing is reducing the sail area and flat is reducing the power of the sails either through making them flatter or twisting them off. In reality, there's three things going on here. You reduce the size of the sails and you reshape the sails through flat and twist. So the numbers that we give here are kind of a composite of what's happening with that. We also list which head sail uh, you're using to get that optimal performance. Here's again a polar chart. Um, I've extracted only one curve and I'm showing a little bit more detail. This is the jib and it goes all the way from 180 downwind to its VMG. Let me go back up. This is the spinnaker in the blue curve. Here's the optimum upwind, optimum downwind. Here's the crossover between the two sails. And I think it's interesting to point out that if you are contemplating a sail change or you have some damage, it's always good to know how much you're gonna lose in knots. Um, if, you, if you have a problem flying the, the sail of choice in any condition like this, whether it's gonna be a change or you've got something that's broken. We also provide a table like this. There's a series of tables in the Excel spreadsheet, which we send you, uh, that can be saved out as text files and then imported into any number of popular tactical programs. Uh, you can use this during a race. Uh, it'll be displayed on your on-deck instrumentation so you can see how close to your targets you are. It also gets used for optimal routing, which is a very popular thing to do on distance races where you pull in wind information perhaps current information, the pullers you get from here, uh, the layout of the course, and you can get some guidance from programs like Expedition and others as to what the best way to get from A to B is. Okay, before I do anything else, I would like to thank US Sailing for putting on these things. And in honor of that, I'm gonna put on my US Sailing <clears throat> memorabilia hat from my years of working with Nathan and the crew there. And I'm gonna be switching hats as we go from one event to another. So thank you to US Sailing for putting this on. You're welcome, Jim, looking good over there. Very good. Okay, well, I'll tilt it a little bit so you can see my eyes. Okay, Nathan and I made a trip out to Bayview Yacht Club a little over a year ago. It's the home of the Bayview Mac race. They have ORR and OREZ divisions. The purpose was to connect with the owners and the organizers and help them understand how to get into the races, into the, our rules. So we both gave presentations, uh, Nathan on ORR. And hey, Nathan, if you wanna talk for a couple of seconds about that, about what you did, please go ahead. Sure, thanks, Jim. Um, so while we were at the uh, at Bayview Yacht Club last year in January, uh, I gave a few minute presentation on the process for obtaining and renewing an ORR certificate. And in two seconds or less, I guess, the general thing is that uh, um, we have a request for rating form online if you're a new person looking for an ORR certificate. 
uh, and what you can do is just submit that with some basic boat questions and we're going to follow up with the or that's basic boat information and we'll follow up with a couple more questions asking for things like sail measurement certificates for the largest of each type of sail and any other clarifying questions about what you may or may not have on your boat. Um, the other one is for how you would go about renewing uh, an ORR certificate, and that's uh, through our online portal, which is ucs.ussailing.org. And uh, if you've had a certificate in the past, you'll be able to log in there and uh, process the renewal. And that'll come through and we'll see it pop up on our work screen and review a couple of things and then issue the rating via that process. Uh, thank you, Nathan. And I gave a presentation that does the same thing for ORR EZ. It's a rule description and then showing you how to go online uh, to get registered for a certificate with regard to management solutions. I will talk about easy later on. Okay, um, moving into March, we have a Newport Harbor to Cabo race. So what I've done here is extracted out from the yellow big tracker, a point in time along the race. Uh, those of you who race offshore know it's there are wonderful tools for people uh, to observe what's going on. We can use yellow brick and other services to track what the boats are. You can get a wind overlay. Uh, they will provide some estimates of what's going on with the scoring. Um, this boat, this particular race had 27 model hulls ranging from Rio 100 down to a Hobie 33, including a number of high performance boats. Uh, there's a, basically a grand free fleet out on the West Coast. Um, and it even included a Sparkman and Stevens Yall before my era, of course. Uh, the winner was an Andrews 40 fast exit. We had two multi hulls, ticket to ride one, and Maserati uh, participated as well. So, <clears throat> for that race, we do customized handicaps. So the Cabal race has its own unique handicap that reflects the weather patterns expected on the race course. I will show you some tables of this uh, a little bit later on. It's any combination of wind speed and wind angle that um, historically or using uh, some research, uh, the race committee uh, event organizer wants and we work with them to create that. In fact, all the West Coast, East Coast and Great Lakes ORR races use handicaps of, that were customized and developed in collaboration with the events. Um, as an example, I'm going to start with the Transpac race to Hawaii. Uh, up through 2017, we used a wind matrix that reflected the combined wisdom and experience of the sailors and the, the club itself. So I am going to switch hats and put on my Transpac hat and describe this, theory, this study that we did. And <clears throat> this is called an H0 study. I'm don't really have time to explain what an H0 file is, but very briefly, it's a compilation of data that NOAA has put together. They sample uh, wind instruments all over the world. They calibrate their computer model for forecasting purposes, but they archive that starting point before they get into the forecast. And when you have an H0 file, you've picked up a series of these archived models. None of them are really a forecast. Um, they all get saved out into a file. And as you can see on this screen, um, this is a, the layout of the course from Long Beach, California to Hawaii. There's a weather pattern on there that are the green arrows. That's just one point in time. Uh, but what you need to understand about this is that there is a, a full map of the wind speed and direction. And this occurs throughout the entire time of the race. So again, the green arrows you're looking at right now, for instance, these little ones over here in the right are just one point in time that happens to coincide with where the boat is on its trajectory, which is this blue line. So I paused the optimal routing, which is being shown here. And this wind field goes with that. But of course it changes all the time. This black line is the rum line, uh, which people generally don't sail. And in particular, this boat went well north of the rum line um, for whatever reason, that's what the wind showed. And of course, this is a theoretical optimal routing. This is not a yellow brick or other track of a particular boat. But we took the optimal routes like this and we saved 
all these little blue vectors that are kind of hard to see. Well, those vectors are just a recording of the wind direction and the wind speed. So we took uh, a nine boat fleet, seven years of H0 grip files, and we started each race at seven different start times. In theory, a particular wind history could have arrived uh, earlier or after than the other actual start date. And for the purposes of analysis to develop a basically a library of what happens out on that race course historically, you could take that wind history and start any time you want. It's a perfectly valid uh, exercise and it obviously gives us more data to work with. <clears throat> well, all those little vectors I talked about get dropped into bins. So each one of these cells on this spreadsheet is a bin. This one here is centered around six knots of true wind and a wind of zero, which means you're doing equal port starboard beating to go off wind. 52 degrees uh, means you're averaging a wind angle of about 52, which means you're almost hard on the wind. I guess some boats are, <clears throat> but it's a bracket in between the zero and the 60. So we drop all that recorded information into all these bins for all those boats and all those years, and we come out with this entire table. Not surprisingly, the fractions all work out to one. And we do that intentionally because we want to do these as percentages. Uh, I have shaded this in, in Excel using a function which highlights in color uh, the cells with the greatest popularity or frequency of occurrence. So you can see that what we're finding is that, in fact, the hottest spot is 165 at 14 knots. So this region here is generally the hot spot. Now we can break this down into some more viewpoints by looking at what happens across wind speed. There are two graphs on here, two curves. This blue curve shows the wind speed variation. This is the percent occurrence. So uh, this is the one that was in use <clears throat> in ORR up to the 2017 Transpac race. So the peak wind was 16 knots and <clears throat> it occurred a little over 32% of the time. We using the, the wind grid file and the optimal routing, we're finding if I brought, drop it into these bins that we use, <clears throat> it goes a somewhat similar graph. It's not identical, but it's fairly close. And I think that's a tribute to all those experienced sailors in the Transpac and on the Transpac committee that have put in uh, their viewpoints and analysis on what the conditions are. We can also look at the wind angle. So again, the blue curve is what's been recorded or what has been used in ORR for the Transpac race historically. The red is a the files that I was just showing you. <clears throat> um, they were derived from the wind grip analysis. So we can talk about the 50th Transpac race to Hawaii, which was in 2019, 84 monoholes in OR, six multi-holes in ORRMH. Again, it was a really broad diversity of design. Um, I've got a little video that I'm gonna play for you. It was created by the Transpac committee. You know, I know I want to get out on the water when I watch this thing. It looks uh, like a great race. It's on my bucket list. And I also have a video of the, the winner in the monoholes, which is Hamaki. Again, this looks like an enormous amount of fun. One or two. One minute. So I copied this from uh, their own video, which they posted on YouTube. For those of us uh, who are avid fans of the Starboard Portal, I believe we're going to see more from the Hamachi crew in future episodes. Awesome. 
I also want to uh, give a couple credits to the TransPAC committee in general. Uh, they give us tremendous feedback as do a number of race organizers, but I'm talking about TransPAC right now. And I want to personally thank um, Alan Andrews and Stan Honey for helping uh, work out some of these eight zero analyses. Uh, Stan has access to the group files that I use, the NOAA, the eight zero files. And Alan, who's also involved in the, uh, um, the ORA Technical Advisory Committee are enormously helpful in, in uh, helping us work on our technology. Okay, I want to do a little technical sidebar here. Uh, and that's to talk about large row chedsels. These are sales with a mid girth to foot ratio, uh, less than 50%, um, I'm sorry, between 50 and 75%. As you know, less than 50% or actually equal less than 50 is a, what we call a Genoa jib. Greater than 75% is a spinnaker. And historically in the VPP rules and others, sales between 50 and 75% were not allowed. Well, an LRH fills in that gap between 50 and 75%. In ORR, we treat it as a new class of sales. It has its own tack, its own hoist, its own sail aerodynamics. So what does a sail look like that, like that look like? Um, well, it could be any number of things. This is a, a sail plan for a TP-52. Um, it's got a flathead main, a fairly large asymmetrical spinnaker on a sprit. Okay, the jib is this triangle here on this head stay here, relatively small sail. Uh, the LRH that I've drawn here, and it's just a sample one, is basically a fractional LRH. It could be a masthead one, and many are. Um, I gave it a half width to foot of 62.5%, um, but I was drawing this sail in, and you can see that it is quite a bit bigger than the jib, um, and it fits in nicely in between the spinnaker and the jib, which is what the intent is. Um, it helps with close reaching. I've also listed all the measurements that we use. We don't know whether it's a spinnaker or a jib. In fact, it's somewhere on the spectrum in between the two. So Nathan and his team will measure sails both as spinnakers and jibs. And then we figure out where in the spectrum it is. And we choose our aerodynamic model to do that. So you might question, well, why do we have large roach head soles? Basically, it's because we listen to sailors. And this has been an issue for about eight years and we're simply waiting for the market place to be strong enough that it made sense for us to handicap them. Many contemporary designs struggle when close reaching, particularly boats that are fractionally rigged with non-overlapping head soles. Now, when you break off, <clears throat> when you start footing off from your upwind optimum angles, before you can put a spinnaker up, uh, you, don't, you still have that small non-overlapping jib and in light to moderate air, the boat would certainly like more. So the LRH uh, fits in that spot very nicely and it allows people to build the spinnakers they want and not try to have a spinnaker go really, really close winded. And uh, the feedback I had from sailors when we first started talking about this was that the sails that they were building would have an unstable luff or an unstable leech. And many of them were flogging enough that the sales did not have the longevity that they wanted from them. So this, again, was a service that we provided because our sailors asked for it. If we take a look at what it looks like and from a performance point of view, this is kind of a light air solution. And we've got our red curve, which is the main plus the jib, and that's the optimum upwind. Here is the main plus the spinnaker, optimum downwind. There is a cusp between the red curve for the, <clears throat> for the jib and the pink curve for the spinnaker. And the LRH is filling in that cusp by some amount. Could be more, it could be less. That obviously depends on the, depends on the size of the large roach head sole. And in fact, if the large roach head sole had a very small mid girth to foot ratio, and it was almost like a Genoa. So let's just say it had a 50 or one or 52% ratio. And it were larger than that <clears throat> largest jib. 
it would actually be faster. So this black curve, which represents the LRH, could easily be up here. So the rule is sensitive to people trying to create an LRH much larger than JIB and going up wind with it. Hey, that's fine, go for it. But we try to be sensitive to the performance and we'll handicap you fairly if you do that. Similarly, you could have an LRH, which is virtually a spinnaker and a larger area than your actual spinnaker. This black curve would be coming down lower and we would rate you for what you have, which is fundamentally the fastest downwind sail. Okay, uh, California Offshore Race Week. We're continuing our travel log. Um, this is a series of events. This, in 19, 2019, they had 41 boats and six ORR and one ORR EZ classes. Um, they used offshore and inshore certificates. So Nathan, maybe you could take another minute and explain why we allow simultaneous certificates and how you do it. Sure thing. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so one of the things that started happening on the West Coast in specific is that boats would do a distance race down to a race week. And this was the primary example originally with Mexorc, uh, where they'd go and race the Cabo race and then stay around in Puerto Vallarta for the week and race Mexorc. And we were finding that boats needed to amend their certificates from their offshore configuration to an inshore configuration, whether that was crew weight or sail selection. Uh, and so to try and reduce the rush that happens to the office at that time when people get there and then are changing their certificates to make sure that they're valid, uh, we created the inshore and offshore ORR certificates, which allows you to have two certificates at once, um, but you can use the offshore one for racing on your offshore race with your offshore mainsail, the lighter crew weight, whatever the case is. And then you have your inshore certificate for the other configuration that represents that set. Uh, and that doesn't just apply to uh, um, the West Coast races that now applies to all boats that want an ORR certificate. So if you find yourself doing a race on the East Coast or doing a Chicago Mac and then a Verve Cup or something like that, uh, it allows you to make sure that you're prepared for both of those. Uh, so once again, I'd just like to emphasize that we bend over backwards to provide race organizers and racers uh, what they need to have a good sailing experience. Okay, um, let's switch on back to the East Coast now, Marion Bermuda race. Uh, we did a scoring study for them. They were experiencing what seems to frequently happen on a race that goes from Southern New England to Bermuda. Uh, a high system settles in over the region and we get parking lots. And oftentimes the slow boats will catch up to the fast boats at that parking lot. When the wind comes in, the race starts over again, but it's a much shorter distance. And for the fast boats, they got caught by that. Uh, becomes almost impossible to beat the slow boats. They just don't have enough runway to establish uh, the time differential they need. Uh, and it's often the case that the fastest boats miss those highs. If I do combined scoring of all the divisions like in a Newport Bermuda race, it's often the fastest boats that win and then the slowest boats that win. Um, so we're always looking for ways to deal with this to try to uh, make for a better experience. Marion Bermuda as I said, is facing the same problem. So uh, they came up with an idea and we worked with them on that, that if it was a slow race, they would reduce the elapsed time. In other words, they would assume that all boats got caught in a parking lot. And we've tried looking at an arbitrary um, reduction in elapsed time and then rescore the races on that. So basically there was a period in the middle of the race when nothing was happening. Since they use time on time scoring, uh, we don't want boat A and boat B to uh, have the differential between them increasing when they're not sailing. We also have done some H0, H0 post-race analysis for them um, because they're looking into the possibility of doing this for them. And what you're seeing on the screen here uh, is an expedition display. Again, I'd like to thank Nick White for uh, providing expedition to us to use for these diagnostic purposes. So uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, an old schooner. It's run by um, Tabor Academy. The boat's called Tabor Boy. The, uh, <clears throat> the yellow, I'm sorry, the, uh, the blue curve here is the optimal route um, that theoretically they should have traveled if the wind was what the wind grip file showed, if the polars are correct, and if they sail perfectly. Uh, you can see that their actual course 
was this pink line here. So they and a number of other boats headed off east uh, long before the weather suggested they do that. Um, I would say most boats did that. So um, I would also point out that the wind group file is not necessarily accurate. But what we did for the race was we provided a graphic like this in a document uh, that was provided to every one of the hand, every one of the competitors down in Bermuda. So they had a, a post-race get together. Everyone got an image. I think it was on paper of these two tracks for their boat, and that led to a lively discussion on who went where and why people did well and didn't do well. Okay, we're switching to the Great Lakes. So I'm going to put my Transpac hat away, and I've got a Chicago Mac hat. Uh, from some years back. Uh, the core events in the Great Lakes for us <clears throat> are the Chicago and Bayview Max. Chicago Max is our biggest ORR fleet in the United States. Not only is it the biggest, it runs every year. So thank you, Chicago Yacht Club, for using ORR. Uh, it's obviously a source of keeping Nathan and I um, financially viable, as well as everyone else. So we really appreciate that. They use OR customized ratings. Again, we collaborate with the race committee, uh, Ron White and his team that worked with Nathan and I on looking at um, alternative handicaps. They, they use three right now, but Nathan and I looked at six a couple years ago. The three they use, um, there's a generic one, which means you got a little bit of everything. It's like a random handicap or an all-purpose one. There's a mostly offwind, and we certainly we recently added the mostly upwind. They make the decision the night before based on what they're seeing with the weather as to go with the default, which is the all-purpose one, or to go with the mostly upwind and mostly downwind. They make that announcement, and then all the race racers know what they're using for a handicap. Switching over to the Bayview Mac, um, they use both ORR and ORREZ. There are two divisions of their race. There's the Cove Island course, which is longer than the shore course. Uh, and they divide boats into division uh, based on the boat speed. So we use an ORR GPH. If you're faster, you go in the Cove Island. If you're slower, you go in the shore course. And um, knowing sailors, I think we anticipated that some of the guys on the borderline were gonna say, well, what happens if I put on a fixed prop? which is a horrible thing to do to a boat if you, if you have a folding one. But, um, you know, people want to go in the uh, shore course with some of their buddies. So uh, if they get slower than that division with a fixed prop, then uh, more power to them. Uh, both events are examples of the diversity of scoring choices that U.S. race organizers like to make. Well, let's switch all the way back to the East Coast again, Marblehead Halifax Ocean Race. Um, this is an opportunity to talk about a little bit of an anecdote of, of what race organizers uh, face. And, you know, they are very important clients uh, that the offshore office and ORA deal with. Uh, there's been a progression of ratings that they use. Um, they try to open it up historically to get as many boats as they can. And that's certainly the goal of any race. We want people to come. So the a few years ago, they had IRC, PHRF, and ORR as an alternative scoring. So IRC and PERF were the primary choices, and people would select one or the other. But quite a few of them would also uh, al select ORR for alternative scoring. And the ORR fleet was larger than one of the others was, ultimately. What was interesting was the race organizer did a survey. Uh, he polled his fleet and asked them, what handicap system was their choice and why? And they all picked IRC or PHRF. I don't know that anyone picked ORR. And the reason given was that IRC and PHRF were single number rules. And frankly, that's fine for a season where over the course of the season, different boats get chances of win, which means you have more winners, more people on the podium. And over the course of the season, things average out to the best sailed boat the most deserving boats probably going to get the season trophy. But for a single race, single event like Marble had Halifax Ocean Race, um, most people would like to have a handicap choice that fits the conditions of the race. And this race 
is historically an off-wind course. Well, the racers liked IRC and PHRF because they could optimize their boats, well, as related to me. They could go with a smaller jib and a larger spinnaker. They may end up with the same IRC or PHRF rating because it's, they did the balance for that. Uh, but they were a faster downwind boat. So they felt uh, they were beating the rule, even though maybe a, quite a few of the boats were doing this. Um, ultimately, the race committee decided what they thought was the best solution for um, their race. And there had been shifting um, degrees of, um, of how much people participate in the different rules. So a few years ago, they transitioned to all the PHRF and ORR. And we've been talking about to them about using OREZ as well. Okay, still on the East Coast, um, the next event is the Ted Hood Regatta. Uh, this is in Marblehead, Massachusetts. It's a major weekend series. Uh, they use OREZ as the primary rule. There's also a PHRF fleet. And I put in the promo, which I stole off of their website. So the image there is from their site. And um, there's a down at the bottom, a thank you to the Storm Trisel Club. Uh, because they help run this event, uh, Ted Hood Regatta, and um, thank you for them and Louie Call and Yacht Scoring for implementing ORR Easy Scoring. Back to the West Coast. <clears throat> There's a series of races, uh, Long Point Race Week, the Islands Race, and Rolex Big Boat Series. Um, I've got a Rolex hat, but we're going to get back to Rolex in a few more minutes. This series uh, goes from all the way the, um, from the Northern California to Southern California, it's Cabo to PV to Transpac, uh, Race Week, which we discussed, and Rolex and St. Francis. Um, what they've got on going on the West Coast is a very exciting series of races. It's very stimulating for competition. You've got continuity, excitement, and participation. It's the result of collaboration between the clubs and with ORA, ORR on developing um, the handicaps for those events. Um, and we use, <clears throat> at ORA, we have some season championships. So we hand out trophies for that. Uh, I'll let me put the uh, Rolex hat on and I'll take it back off later on. We're working with them on multiple versus single handicapping for the big boat series. It's, this is an interesting problem because we we had multiple ratings last year, and that meant for each race, the race committee could pick the one that was most appropriate to the conditions, was windward, leeward, 50-50, or 60-40, or high winds or moderate winds. And there's also a custom San Francisco Bay race, which has a little bit of reaching in it. And the feedback we got was that it was probably the closest score and they've had in a long time. Uh, and a number of people thought, um, thought it was great but also a number of people um, would prefer just to have one handicap uh, so that they always know what the relationship between their boat is and another boat out on the water. So we rescored all the races using a single handicap to see what the downside was. Um, the upside was that the same boats won the series. All right, the downside was in a particular race, there were some different orders of the podium finishes, uh, but they made the balancing between complexity and accuracy and simplicity. And we're working on a single handicap to meet the needs of their uh, sailors and the racer, uh, race organizers. All right, Puerto Vallarta race, San Diego Yacht Club. So I'm putting on my PV hat. Again, here's a yellow brick um, display. You can see the boats finishing. Uh, down at the bottom, Pi Wackett and Cabrone had an extremely close finish. And I think they were finishing uh, after hours, which means the wind had shut down and it was a very difficult and challenging um, event. And uh, it was a very close switch off in the finishes at the end with Cabrone being first over the line. On the left side is an extract from Yacht Scoring, which shows uh, the fleet that participated. Uh, we've worked with San Diego um, on this international race uh, for a number of years. Uh, it's always a joy to work with those guys. 
So um, let's go to Mexorc. Um, Puerto Vallarta race is actually a feeder to Mexorc. So I'm putting on my Mexorc hat. And I'd like to give a shout out to the people in Mexico who have been using ORR for quite a while. Uh, the boat you're seeing here, Viva Mexico. <clears throat> Mexico is a uh, it's the Brockmans um, who helped bring ORR into the Acapulco area. Acapulco uses um, the rule for around the buoy racing um, every month to get together um, and they have a weekend of races. They also particip participated in the Port of Yarda race, uh, but not for Mexorc. So this is kind of a transition slide. But again, thank you to the Brockman family for all they do for uh, Mexican racing and for <clears throat> ORR. Also, I'm showing Ernesto Ompton's boat, Bandito. Uh, Ernesto is the organizer of Mexor, which is a biennial regatta, which attracts um, all the best of the Mexican fleet, as well as those from the PV race who opt to stay there. So let's talk about the location here. It's Banderas Bay. <clears throat> There's an image there. Uh, I'm only showing this to emphasize this area here, which is a big flat area, it includes the airport. This area is like an oven. So it heats up <clears throat> when the sun hits it and creates a really nice thermal breeze. Um, I've got an image here. Uh, this is a forecast from uh, one of the websites saying what the wind is gonna be today. So you can see the little vectors that bends around and goes into this thermal area here of the oven. Uh, start that up again. And the racing area, we have distance races which go out to the islands and back. And there's a lot of wind here, not so much wind here. It gets to be uh, a good challenge. But uh, the nice thing about this is that oven really does cook and create wonderful experience, sailing experience. Here we are at the start of the first race. And you can see it starts right off the beach in downtown <clears throat> Puerto Vallarta. Uh, here is right after the start and one of the races, a little bit more wind, uh, three boats here highlighted are all boats from Southern California. Snoopy, Pelagroso, and Trouble. Uh, Fast Exit uh, is also a PV boat that stayed around. Um, I brought this slide in, in particular, to show the range of boats that ORR has had to deal with over the years. It's been a, quite a challenge um, to deal with state-of-the-art boats that uh, have many different kinds of configurations and push the envelope technically. We also have boats like Olus Lindus. This is an owner driver. Um, and Linda has a local talent who knows the, uh, knows the area, Mike Danielson, and helps guide her. And she does very well in class. Um, one of the things that we like about ORR is that um, we don't do anything funny with the rule, but we mind our P's and Q's and the details of the science so that many different kinds of boats can win. And if I can steal a quote from Stan Honey from the Transpac uh, board and also from ORA's board, and I think you all know him as a, a world-class navigator on many big boats. Um, he said that people like to complain about all the different kinds of boats that, that win races in, in ORR. And as he said, if, if we're doing that, then we must be doing something right. If, a wide diversity of boats can win races. Okay, um, here's the last slide that I have for mix work. It's just a nice into the sun picture of boats coming across the finish line. Well, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 crisis, a number of boats and races, I should say, have been canceled. Uh, I'd like to talk about Newport Bermuda, so I'm going to switch hats again. Put in my Newport Bermuda and I Hat on, and let's just talk about what we were doing before the race got canceled. We did another 8-0 study for them. Um, again, thank you to Stan Honey for help with that. The plot that I'm showing here is a summary of all the routing results that we did. And over here is an optimal route, uh, one particular uh, wind grip file, a historical file and the boats that we ran through it. And you can see uh, there's a curve here for each of the wind speeds from six to 24. The horizontal axis, this is upwind, that's zero as a true wind angle. There's really not much content 
at sailing hard on the wind, even port starboard tacks. There is a good bit of content at 40, 45, which is still hard on the wind, but basically you're sailing where you want to go and you don't have to tack. At the other end, there's very little port starboard jiving downwind. Uh, these are all hard on the, these are all sailing at your optimum angle for the most part. And there is content here, but again, you're pretty much sailing in the direction you want to go. And the major content uh, is in this region here. This wiggly curve is 24 knots. The reason it's so wiggly is that 24 doesn't happen very often. So there's a little bit more noise in, uh, in the signal that we get. What's interesting about this particular weather pattern that I showed was the contraction of the ice, isochrones. Isochrones, and I'll show this one here, are curves at which a boat could be at any given specific time, depending on what trajectory they took across the race course. So you could be, say, after X hours, whatever that number is, I don't know, you could be anywhere along this curve. So if this is a two hour gap, you could go from this curve to curve, this curve in two hours. Well, when you see isochrones like this, so close together, it means that you're not really covering very much distance, if any distance at all, during those two hours. And it's this system created by high settling on the race course they were trying to deal with. Race is canceled, uh, Transpac race to Tahiti, uh, what a shame. Again, working with Stan, his guys, and Alan, uh, another 8-0 study uh, derived a handicap for them. California offshore race, race week has been canceled. So if this is bad news, uh, what do we have for good news? Um, I'd like to add on to a graph that uh, Dobbs Davis presented um, in his <clears throat> presentation a week ago. It was missing some of the 2019 data. Um, this is a slide that our executive director, John Horton, put together. And it's just showing um, VPP handicaps in the United States and the growth that we've had in uh, 2019. So we had 248 ORC club and 502 ORR EZ certificates. That was, I think, the third year of EZ. And this rule had been doubling every year. We started off in, uh, with the Bayview Mac people and the Massachusetts Bay and it's been growing. Um, there were 70 ORCI, 625 ORR certificates in a non-Bermuda race here for a total of 318 ORC and 1,127 ORR. So we're actually seeing quite a few more people um, opting to investigate uh, the benefits of VPP handicapping. So let's talk about ORREZ. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail um, historical justification, a lot of people are asking for perf help. Um, we get individual requests for handicap analysis. We've done fleet studies for perf handicaps, handicappers from Florida to New England, spinnaker, non-spinnaker, pulled versus thin line asymmetrics, feathering versus, uh, feathering and folding versus fixed props. Uh, when I was at uh, US Sailing, we conducted a lot of studies like this. And it was our conclusion that a lot of sailors and race organizers were looking for something uh, that had multiple handicaps, was inexpensive, and could deal with changes in boats that people like to do. So we developed a hybrid rule. It's power of VPP, but fewer measurements. And we use owner supplied data. We have multiple ratings. We do have occasionally some ratings that we adjust. And we simply do it. We tabulate this very carefully. It's done by a national review panel. We look at the design and decide whether there's some characteristic of that boat, which is not properly <clears throat> captured by measurement rules, whether it's a, a VPP rule or a formulaic rule. There are boats that don't perform to what the numbers say. So uh, with a lot of discretion, um, we will make an adjustment that allows a boat like that to uh, to compete reasonably well in a boat that's using a VPP. We have a build a boat program in which we actually <clears throat> take what information we can and build a boat. We only do this if the boat was never measured for a VPP rule or we cannot get the, uh, 
a file from the designer. So this is an engine. We took brochure data. We surfaced it up and then we cut it with all these blue curves, which are what goes into the VPP. Well, here's a case where we got the actual lines for a boat. We imported it into CAD, surfaced it up and created our model of the IOD. Uh, here's a boat that was built in a backyard in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, different donor now up in Massachusetts Bay. All he had was a series of photographs like this, uh, but we created his boat model. Uh, he then went out and set the boat up in a uh, parking lot, got a little laser, set up a grid and gave us some measurements. And I was able to tweak the file and get it to be a more accurate uh, <clears throat> boat shape. Here is the Pride of Baltimore. It's a gaff rig topsail schooner, uh, quite a challenge. We modeled that up and created an offsail from it. Uh, another boat, Mayan, a John Alden design. We got the lines, um, built this VPP model from it. Um, <clears throat> boat sails out in the Rolex Big Boat series under ORREZ. So this is Mayan here coming off the start line with one of the other boats. Um, you could tell it's San Francisco Bay by that cloud bank. I don't know where else you get a cloud bank almost every race. Um, here comes mine in at the finish. Um, the wind is built up as it typically does in the bay because they get a wonderful thermal there. If you want to do OREZ, <clears throat> you can go to www.regattaman.com. Uh, it's very easy to get in. You give your name, the kind of boat, and you're off and running and you can get a certificate. So uh, I'd like to conclude by saying ORR easy can handicap anything. This is an image taken from Mexwork this year. This is our leeward mark, a boat going upwind, a boat going downwind, and there was a moving obstacle during the middle of the race. Um, we're not up to handicapping that yet, um, but we're working on it. So although we say we can handicap anything, well, not quite, we're not really there yet. Uh, this again is Banderas Bay. And anyone who is really looking for some spectacular sailing, you just look at these white caps out here, the fun these guys are having. Uh, the photos that I've showed you are only a glimpse of what goes on there. So all of us at ORA say thank you to all the sailors, regattas and volunteers that we get to serve. Be safe, we'll see you on the water soon. And I have one more hat switch to do. Um, this is one from uh, New York Yacht Club annual regatta a few years ago. And this is kind of a shout out to New York Yacht Club, hoping you and all the other events um, throughout the United States are gonna be getting out on the water. Uh, you're gonna be safe. You're gonna be able to have your events. Um, so best wishes from the ORA. And that concludes my presentation. So. Nathan, if you have any questions. Um, Great. Here I am. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, I think you did a little bit of addressing of this, but from John Stianga, and I'm sorry on the name, uh, he's asking uh, how or why does the TCF change by between races? For example, his question was specific to the uh, Bayview Mac and the Chicago Mac. And I think you explained what it is, but maybe you can give us a little bit of an example there between them. You want to know what the difference in their handicaps are? Well, why the Bayview Mac may show substantially different than say the Chicago Mac downwind or whatever the case is. Uh, well, of course I'm not an expert on that. They are different bodies of water, different Great Lakes. I have no particular reason to um, believe one lake has different weather than the other or one handicap solution is better than the other. But it is an example of uh, one group thinks that this works and they do their analysis, they do their homework. Another group, I know Bayview has monitored the wind on some weather stations and we've worked on that. Um, and they have come up uh, with the matrix that they find works for them. Uh, I think to answer that question, I would also have to know why some people are Democrats and some are Republicans and some are independents. I think we all have different views on the world and. Uh, there's nothing to say one view is right and the other is wrong. 
Great, thank you. Uh, next question from Ed Cesar is asking, when you're looking at that H0 uh, file for boats like Tabor Boy, uh, does that include current? No, this one did not. And uh, I'm looking forward when we have the next Bermuda, Marion Bermuda race, uh, getting a, a grip file for the current so I can superimpose it. Um, I've asked a number of navigators and worked with the race organizers. Ed, if you've got a grip file for that Marion Bermuda race of, of last year, send it to me and I will redo this. I'll do it for, do for Tabor Boy, any number of other boats, um, and I will supply those results to uh, to Mary Pierce and her team at Marion Bermuda to distribute. So that's a request on my part. Great, thanks, Jim. We do have a little bit of uh, ORR uh, celebrity in the way, not celebrity, but maybe success story. Bill Hardesty is uh, commenting on your hat collection saying it's uh, very thorough and I have to echo that. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, you know, Al Clerk is trying to clarify on what John's question was and asking why the races have different wind mixes. Why Bayview has different wind mixes? Bayview versus Chicago has a different wind mix, yes. Uh, because the Bayview Yacht Club, um, I forget what they call their organizing authority. They use the word, they sat down uh, with some of the technical people and they decided what they wanted to use. So I think Al brings up a good point though. Why is it different? Uh, maybe the two events want to get together and compare notes on this. Um, we are happy to work with organizers and sailors to provide what they want. And honestly, as I said, I don't know if there are any significant differences between what the two lakes see. I do know that um, the, the Bayview Mac ends up uh, with a long finish that's historically a little bit more on the wind than what um, Chicago has, which is mostly after Fox Island, I guess is mostly off the wind getting up to Mackinac Island. So I can say there is a little bit more upwind content in what is being used by the Bayview folks than, than the all purpose one being used by Chicago Mac. That's also particularly true for the Cove Island course uh, because they got that very long stretch that can have quite a bit of upwind content. Makes sense. Uh, question from Sheila McCurdy. Could you comment uh, on the pros and cons of rating rule transparency? Uh, well, transparency is a really good word. It's also a popular buzzword. And uh, I think it's a matter of of finding the appropriate degree of transparency. Um, we try to be as, as transparent as we can uh, with everything we do, um, but there is a, there are rule philosophies about that as to what you want to have transparent and not. Um, let me say for, for starters, um, having done VPPs for, gee, Nathan, I thought you said it was, it was three decades. You're trying to age me or something? Uh, <laughs> I'm in the camp of thinking there is no VPP rule that's really all that transparent. If you were to apply the, supply the source code, and, and no one does, by the way, um, then there are a few design offices that would want to pour over it. And with IMS, we used to supply uh, the, the source code for the uh, VPP part. I'm going to break the code into two chunks. One analyzes uh, the offset file, we call that the LPP or lines processing program. And for reasons that I never fully understood, that code was never supplied. The VPP part uh, takes the output of the LPP, which is basically the hydrodynamics of the bow and uh, enough about the sail to compute the aerodynamics and does all the equilibration to come up with your pullers. We used to provide that source code to anyone that wanted to buy it. Uh, but the ORC does not make that um, available either. So I think the transparency they may be talking about is, is allowing people to purchase the code and, un, and run unlimited trials on that. So this is an interesting philosophical point. Um, like IRC, uh, we at ORR who deal with a lot of Grand Prix boats, and I would remark that most Grand Prix design has been living in the IRC camp for the last 
15 years, uh, but we have to deal with them also. And um, our goal is to protect the great bulk of sailors who race, the middle of the fleet where all the numbers are, uh, because our index of merit is how many people get ORR certificates, how many people participate in our uh, client regattas. And so we try to be fair to all. Obviously we welcome the Grand Prix boats into our rule and I've shown a number of pictures and slides that list some of those boats. And, and frankly, they do very well in the rule. Um, but my experience as a designer and as a rule maker is if you, if you provide unlimited access to a rule, it doesn't, doesn't take long uh, for really careful designers, sophisticated analyzers to run boats through and, and look for soft spots in a rule. And I don't think ORR has any, has very many soft spots. And frankly, I'm not really aware of any strong ones, although there are things that we're working on. In principle, every rule has soft spots. Um, we've experienced um, rules coming and going because of these. And this is what happened uh, in 2004 when the uh, United States and Australia and a number of other countries dropped the rule that they were using and went to another route. And that's when we, we developed ORR out of AmeriCap. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, she always got a good question, uh, transparency. Again, we choose transparency where we think it, it really does suit our, our sailors and we keep some things um, not available in order to protect the bulk of the fleet. Makes sense. Uh, quick, easy question from uh, Rick Reed. Is ORREZ up and running? Oh yeah, uh, we launched it, um, I guess 2016, there was a precursor to that, Triple Number Plus, which uh, was developed at the request of the sailors local to us here in Newport, uh, it's the Buzzards Bay area. So they contacted us and, and we developed um, this rule for them and they used it for a year. Uh, it solved a lot of their problems, um, but of course with any new rule, um, getting momentum uh, critical mass is really an issue. And there weren't enough boats, enough fleets that joining in. And they came back after a season and said, this is great, but we have regattas in which we invite people from other regions. And we can't get them into EZ at the last minute like we can Perf. Well, the next year, actually that summer, we were approached by the Massachusetts Bay Fleet, uh, Massachusetts Bay Race Association, I guess they're called, uh, because they wanted to switch from PHRF and they thought they looked around and decided that what we were doing with triple number plus and ORREZ um, was the way to go. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself because it was Al de Klerk's friends at Bayview Yacht Club uh, that approached us to use EZ for their shore course. And then we got the Bayview Mac, I'm sorry, that was the Bayview Mac shore course fleet. And then the uh, Mass Bay fleet came in at the same time, we were getting a fleet um, in the Chesapeake. So it was the Racer Cruises, Cruiser Association. And the guy that's really been behind that is Jay Tyson. And you know, a lot of the time it comes down to finding people, people who are ambitious, people who work hard, who are trying to develop services for sailors and empowering those people. So Jay has opened up the Chesapeake and uh, the Gulf a yachting Association, EZ, and we have large fleets in both of those. So uh, we've been around for, I think, a 16, 17, 18, 19. We're now going into our fifth year. Um, as I said earlier, the first couple of years, we were doubling our growth. Um, I don't think that's going to happen this year. A lot of it depends on what happens with the progression of COVID-19. And uh, I think we're all hoping that all the events that we participate in will, will occur. Makes sense. Uh, we're getting a little bit of commentary on scoring. And one of the, uh, I think the root question here is, would you recommend defining a wind speed after the race, essentially? No. Um, <laughs> if you want to get your head handed to you, that's a great thing to do. Uh, you know, it's this question is brought up many times and it has become actually the focal point of a, a lot of my work, it's not 
how well is the VPP working? How good are the handicaps? It's how do you develop a scoring system um, that works for a regatta? And I even delivered a paper at the Chesapeake Symposium a year ago on scoring because the scoring methodology has become the big issue. It's not the choice of rules. So we've looked at pre-race um, scoring or post-race scoring and what you're talking about right now is an option for post-race scoring, picking the wind um, after the race. Um, you know, a guy like Jay Tyson, who I mentioned a minute ago, has the trust of the people that he works with in his Cruiser Racer Association. So he will do post-race scoring, he will pick the wind speed and he might pick the course content and do what we call a constructed course. Uh, but if I go back in history about 22 years ago, we were doing this in IMS in the United States. And we had uh, typically three ratings, light, medium, and heavy. And uh, we encouraged race organizers to fly a flag, perhaps with the 10 minute gun, as to whether they were gonna use light, medium, or heavy. Uh, we all thought this was a good idea because it would make for fairer racing. Well, like I said, they got their heads handed to them by some of the competitors afterwards that said, you picked medium, but it was heavy. And by the way, if you used heavy, I would have won and the other guy would have come in third or, or that kind of thing. It's, uh, so it leads to a lot of post-race, uh, let's call it unease um, at the worst case accusations. It also means that when you're racing, um, you don't know what your handicap is. So a lot of people like to know, you know, you know, how much time do I owe Nathan or does he owe me out on the race course? As we go around the marks, um, I wanna keep track of that differential and who's winning because it affects the tactics during the race. Okay, um, we're listening to competitors and what they want. At the other end of the spectrum, you might have people that are looking for absolute fairness. And I'll put the fairness in the word quotes because uh, it's debatable on what fairness means. But let's, let's talk about technical precision of the handicapping. After the race, you know what occurred out on the race course, you know where the wind came from and the speed, um, and you can develop that post-race model. And I think arguably you can come up with a better um, estimate of who sailed their boat best and give them the trophy. So there's that attraction, but there's also the complexity of the issues that I just mentioned and not knowing how you're doing during the race. Um, so it's a matter of where in the spectrum you wanna be and what suits the sailors. And I think different kinds of sailors appreciate different uh, approaches. It's my opinion uh, that a lot of the professional sailors and the top programs Yes, they'd like to know how they're doing the race, but they'd also like to know that the best sailed boat won. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, people um, like to know how they're doing in the race course also, but they also appreciate a little bit of luck. And <clears throat> I think it's worth spending about 20 seconds talking about luck. In my 30 years of doing this, my first 20, I would define myself, uh, or I'd give myself the label as a as a technical purist. And to some extent, our team is always looking to have the most accurate VPP, that's what we do. Uh, but there's a role for luck in racing. This is the entertainment industry as Greg Stewart likes to say. Our index of merit is how many people are coming out and racing and how much fun we're having. And luck plays a role in that. Um, if, let's just say Nathan, you're a better sailor than I am, which is probably true. If I'm going to beat you, it's not by sailing next to you and a similar speed boat. I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm going to look for some luck or maybe if it's not my own decision-making tactics, I'm going to look for some luck where deviating from you gets me into a better wind condition and I can get to that finish line and beat you on corrected time. Luck um, brings more people out because it gets more people on, on the podium. So is it heresy for a VPP guy to say, I'd like to see some luck in races? All right, I'm her, I'm a heretic then. It, had, it plays this role. And again, it's a matter of, of suiting um, the product to the sailor. And I think we try to, um, to do that as well as we can. 
And what we're doing now uh, may be different than what we're doing five and 10 years ago, uh, depending on uh, what portion of the sailing population we're serving with, with these customized products. Great. I, I think that makes perfect sense. And Jim, just for the record, I think if uh, we do get on the race course this year, then maybe we should be on the same boat. Sounds like a good idea. Oh, what do you have to offer? <laughs> well, you know that I'm, I'm just a lowly cat boat sailor, but. Uh... <laughs> well, I have an optimist here at home, which is too small for either one of us, let alone both of us. <laughs> Understood. Well, I think uh, that just about wraps up all the questions that we've had. Uh, and so, Jim, I just want to say thank you again for joining us and thank you to the viewers for turning in, tuning in. If you want to see more from Jim and the Offshore Racing Association, be sure to check them out at www.offshoreracingrule.org. That's also linked in the live screen description, so you can go and visit uh, there. If you've enjoyed today's session, please support our efforts to build a community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing a U.S. sailing membership. We have a lot of great content coming up on the schedule, and thanks to U.S. sailing members, we're able to adapt and evolve to better sail serve sailors with content like this. Visit us at the link in the uh, live stream description to join or renew your U.S. sailing membership today. Thanks again and have a great afternoon.